Hello and welcome to another video from Dazatron's Diorama Llama. And in this make, we're going to look at building a, I suppose an organic display stand um, is the best way I can describe it. So I've got here um, movie masterpiece Bumblebee. Um, I think this is MPM07, I think. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so that was actually one of my first um, masterpiece transformers. Um, besides hot rod and this here is a really recent uh, purchase so this is free zeros um mini kind of bumblebee um really really pleased with him he, he doesn't transform which i'm always a bit unsure of should i buy a non-transforming transformer but he is just so good the articulation and detail on that thing is brilliant so with the um the masterpiece uh, bumblebee there he's obviously the larger figure so i'm just checking to see how he sits on a couple of offcuts i've got and these are quite large pieces so i've got a longer piece and this kind of more square uh, chunk of styrofoam there so this one it should fit quite nicely on there i wanted to have a, a more dynamic stance i don't want it to just be kind of in the the normal kind of stoic kind of pose so i do want his feet to be quite wide apart and again just with a smaller figure um i'm just going to check that on this smaller piece and yeah that fits nicely now i have got a couple more bumblebees that will be in this display so i am creating a display for four bumblebee figures um i don't usually collect the same character but there's a couple of kind of characters that I really like um hot rods one of them bumblebee um love bludgeon as well um although I don't have many bludgeons but um he's a great character and sea spray so those would probably be um a few of the characters that I would collect multiples of so on this larger piece here I'm just marking out this kind of organic shape so this kind of shapes based on kind of natural forms um one of my favorite artists is Henry Moore and um, there'll be a picture on the screen in a moment. So you'll get an idea of the kind of shapes I'm talking about. But this is also based on a scene from Transformers the movie. And uh, this is the 86 movie. Um, and again, they've got these kind of more kind of organic shapes going on there. So this is where the electric wire cutter really comes into its own because it's kind of made really for these um, kind of flowing lines and curves it's ideal for that and you've seen me use this many many times on previous videos so I'm just doing a rough cut at the moment and the nice thing about this is that this will give me two pieces to work with if I need to so at least I'm not kind of wasting the block. Um, I can still reuse the, um, the other half if I need to at some other point later on. So I'm just deciding on the piece that I think would work best for the, um, the larger Bumblebee figure. So I quite like that curve on the top there. But of course, I, if it's organic, um, it shouldn't really have any straight edges. So I will need to just kind of get rid of those um, those kind of straight lines and those corners. So I'm just checking how the figure sits on here just to see if I can get him into a reasonable stance without him falling over. And that's really important. At the end of the day, this is a display base. So it does need to work with the characters that you want to display. And of course, you don't have to use Transformers. Um, I hope that's one of the nice things about these bases is that you could use them for a multitude of figures from different franchises. Uh, hopefully it just gives you some ideas um, for your own displays. So that seems to stand quite nicely on there. So I'm quite happy with that. It does help if you're figure as kind of ankle rockers um it just helps to kind of create a, a multitude of poses so i'm just going to use the electric wire cutter again 
um, just to pull away the edges here and again just to kind of complete that more organic look you could use um, a floristry knife or a, um, a regular craft knife to do this if you haven't got the foam cutter and again how far you go with this how much you remove is completely up to you just keep going until you're you're reasonably happy with the shape so i just want quite a a flowing shape now originally i was going to keep one of the or at least the two edges um quite flat so that i could kind of connect the three pieces together um, so it kind of creates one large stand and um, that was the original intention although you'll see as the video progresses I changed my mind on that really um, and that was just to give me some more flexibility so I've got a bit more choice over where I put them um, if I connected them they would have to stay in that position for it to work so I'm just using a large file here just to smooth out that kind of rough cut And I'm not trying to get a perfect finish at the moment. This really is just smoothing it out a little bit more again so I can test the figure and just see if it still stands on there. And that seems to be working okay. Just need to kind of move him around a little bit until I'm happy. What I don't want is the figure to have the potential to keep falling over. So I do want it to be to feel pretty secure in whatever stance um, I decide to put him in. And that seems to work quite well. So I'm just going to use um, a Sharpie pen or a felt tip, whatever you've got at hand, just to put a mark on where the feet are resting at the moment. So at least then I know he stands in that position. So if I do start to um, sand it down a little bit more, I can keep those areas um, reasonably flat. So again, at least I know he was stand up. So once you've got your figure marked out, it is then a case of just kind of finishing off that um, the shape um, with a file and with a bit of sandpaper. Yes, I'm reasonably happy with that. As I said, I will just get rid of that one flat end and I'll, I'll smooth that out. So for the next piece, I wanted um, quite a different shape. Again, keeping those kind of organic lines. So keeping it quite curved. Um, again, I want to use the majority of the, the piece. So I've got two reasonably equal sides. Of course, when I drew that first line, I realised I was going right to the edge, so it would leave me without any kind of base um, for the character to stand on. So I've just had to kind of move that a little bit, just so at least there is a surface at the bottom on the lower edge. And then exactly the same technique, using the, the electric foam cutter, Now, again, you could do this with a saw. Um, not would it be so easy to do, but it, it's possible could, because you are filing it down anyway to get those curves. You could do it. Um, but again, I would encourage you to invest in a foam cutter. They're about £25 from Amazon, so they're not too expensive. And I haven't had to replace the wire yet. You do actually get spare wire with it, but I haven't had to do that. And I've had this, gosh, over six months now. So I've got that main curve. But again, I don't want the flat edges either side. So I want to just kind of shape those a little bit more. 
And I just think it helps to have um, different kind of bases of different heights. Um, so when you put your figures on there, it just again looks a bit more dynamic, a bit more interesting than having them all at the same level. And notice, you know, I'm not being symmetrical with this. I want them to um, be more asymmetrical, again, more organic. So it, it doesn't look like it's being made on a machine. So I'm not sure whether I'm going to use both these pieces yet. So I'm just going to cut this down um, and then see how it looks back on the, the Billy Bookshelf just to give me an idea of whether this will work and that's really important that you keep testing your bases as you're making them to see if they fit within the space before you continue to put the, the I suppose the fine details into your pieces so these are still kind of what I would call rough cuts at the moment Now I do want one of the pieces to have a hole in it. Again, this comes from the original source material from Transformers the movie and also again from the Henry Moore sculptures that have also inspired this piece. So because this has got a higher back, it gives you more space to kind of create a hole in the center. It's the beauty of this foam cutter, it doesn't make it much quicker. So I've got a few kind of rough cuts here. Although I've got four figures to be displayed, I do want one of them just to be on the, the shelf itself. Um, so not all of them will have its own individual stand. And just making sure that there's enough of a kind of a base at the bottom for the character to sit. And um, because these are made for the Bumblebee character, you, you often find with Bumblebee that he, his feet are quite large um, because it's the, the kind of the hubcaps of the of a Volkswagen Beetle. So I need to leave enough space for that. Now, whether you would need to do that would depend on the characters that you want to put in place. So here you can see I've put it back on the shelf um, where I will be displaying these characters and they fit reasonably nice. Um, yeah, that's the other masterpiece. This is the G2 version. It's kind of a metallic gold. I think it's MP21. I can never remember those numbers. So there, that was the larger offcut from the... Um, the initial base that I'd kind of shaped, but I quite liked how tall it was um, by putting it on its side. So I'm thinking rather than using the two kind of arch shapes, I'm gonna have one taller shape as well. So at least then it gets rid of that kind of symmetrical look that I don't want. So again, I'm just creating a bit more space for the character to stand. So this would be my taller piece. So I wanted to kind of curve right over, a bit like a, a wave, I guess, you know, um, on the sea. So just, I'm just kind of marking eight, roughly the shape that I want. And you really can go for any shape with this. Um, that's the beauty of these kind of organic shapes. As long as the, there's lots of curves, that's the key. Um, so you can't really go wrong. So I'm just pulling off that big chunk there. You can do all of this in one go and just try and do it in one piece 
which is quite satisfying but it's quite tricky to do as well and of course you can't go back and add to it although you can glue pieces onto the styrofoam and you could do a bit of a fixed job it's it's more hassle um, more time consuming so i tend to find by just playing it a little bit more carefully um, and just removing smaller pieces a bit at a time um, i can kind of control the shape that i'm trying to create so i'm just testing the free zero bumblebee here and again it's these feet that are causing me a bit of an issue the articulation on this guy is fantastic so i can get in into all sorts of poses but it's just making sure that he actually sits on this stand and because there's a bit of a slant at the bottom of the base that's what's causing him to kind of fall over a little bit but that seems to work pretty well so i'm quite happy with that Yeah, he's got enough space there for his feet. And so, yeah, on this other piece here, I'm just using the the rod attachment rather, rather than the wire attachment that you saw earlier. So just waiting for that to heat up a little bit, just poking a hole all the way through. And then the whole of that rod now is heated up nicely. So I could just move in a circular motion as big as I want that hole to be. So nice and slowly. And you'll get that in one one movement really. Again, you could use um, like a coping saw for this. But it's a bit more of a bother. So that's nice and quick, nice and easy. And I've got a nice kind of shape there that I can just finish off and make it look a little bit better. So again, I've just put the three pieces back in place and I'm happy with the different kind of sizes and scales and heights of these bases. So this has given me an idea of how they'll fit. So now it's just a case of getting them into the shape that I want them to look like and getting that finish that I want. So I'm just starting here with the floristry knife. And the reason why I've moved to the knife rather than the wire cutter is just, again, it gives you that extra bit of control that you don't always get because you've only got to move a little bit with the wire cutter and you've cut into that foam because it's so, so easy. It just kind of slides through the foam like butter, really. Um, so by using the knife, it, again, it gives you that control so you can kind of really shape it how you want to. And then I'm just moving between the the large file and the sandpaper here until I get that finish that I want. And again, I'm trying to get lots of smooth edges. I don't want any flat, straight edges apart from obviously the very bottom of the base itself. But I want as many curves on there as I possibly can. Yeah, I'm quite happy with that. That's almost there. And you can see how it kind of tapers at the bottom and it's quite wide at the top. And it, again, it's not symmetrical in any way. Same with the hole in this, it's not right in the center. And it just creates a more interesting final piece, I think. So again, I'm moving between the file and the sandpaper just to get the finish that I want. It's really important with this one. I really want a, a nice smooth finish with many of the other bases that I've made. I don't mind if you see um, marks from the files, even from, you know, my fingernails or, you know, whatever, really, because I think that all adds to the character, particularly when you're making kind of rock faces. Um, and although this, this could be a rock face, I want this to be as smooth as possible. So I've just decided here to not go with like, um, like a full kind of donut or hoop shape. 
I've just decided to change that a little bit more. So I've cut that away now and smoothed it out. It does look a little bit like um, Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster. And then I've added another hole in the centre of this middle piece. Which kind of looks like those rocks that you get on a beach. You know, once it's kind of the, the sea has eroded these kind of pebbles and they get nice and smooth. It kind of reminds me a little bit of that. And here we go. So this is the finished piece, fully sanded down with the three zero bumblebee in place. So I can see that extra curve. You can just see more of the shape now um, of the base by cutting away a little bit more. And it also doesn't kind of catch on the back of um, bumblebee with the kind of the uh, wheel, the spare wheel on his back. And again, this kind of Loch Ness um, piece here. But it, it's nice because it does help him to, um, it gives him enough space for him to put his kind of his one leg on there. So it creates again a more interesting stance. And then there's the three in position with the characters on there. So all it needs now is um, a bit of paint. But I'm happy with that. And they seem to sit together quite nicely as well on the shelf. So this is a, a new product that I haven't used. That I've seen it used by other people. Um, as you know, I tend to use whatever I've got in the house. I don't tend to go out and buy lots of new stuff. But because I wanted a smooth finish, I thought it'd be a good idea to seal the styrofoam um, to protect it from those kind of dents and those scratches. Again, in the past, that hasn't bothered me because I think it adds to the character. But because I want this to retain that kind of smooth quality, I wanted it to have a bit of a tougher surface. So Mod Podge, it's what they use for decoupage. Um, it's a good kind of sealant for wood. So, um, I mean, it actually it protects the wood for a long time. So it's a real tough finish once you've added a few coats of it. Um, so it's really good stuff. So it, it looks like PVA. It goes on like PVA glue. I'd imagine it's similar in its makeup to PVA. I don't exactly know what Mod Podge is made out of. Um, but it does resemble that quite a lot. And it goes on really nicely really easily um, I've used a nice soft brush so I'm not getting lots of brush marks because again I want that to have a smooth surface and then this is after 24 hours now it does say the cure time is three to four weeks which is you know a long time but I th again I think that is if you're putting it onto furniture you might need to leave it that long so you can just hear the noise there, you, you can, it has got a different feel to it, um, it feels a lot more solid, it feels like it's got um, a harder surface. This is regular styrofoam, so if I just kind of, you hear the sound in a moment. So you can see, well you can hear the difference between the styrofoam we've had, the Mod Podge, and the styrofoam with the sealant on there um, so it does it does create a nicer finish so I'm just using regular acrylic paint this is um, system free you don't have to use this this is I suppose a little bit more expensive for acrylic paint it's quite a, a decent make but you could just use cheap um, yeah kind of home brand acrylic paint so again I'm using a nice soft brush just so I can get rid of as many brush marks as possible now I didn't do this with the first piece but I did find that when you once the Mod Podge has hardened it does leave almost like a kind of a gritty texture I don't know why that is um, I don't know if it's because there's bits of dust on there that I haven't cleaned off so where it's kind of you know and made that a bit more solid and that's creating the issue so I've just used a bit of sandpaper over the top just to smooth it out a little bit more again you can't really see it um, looking at the pieces but you can definitely feel it 
So I'm just sanding these other two pieces down before I prime them. Now you can use um, modeling acrylics as well, but again, they don't go very far. They are, they are made for miniatures. And obviously these are much bigger than that. So that's why I think it is worth picking up just some cheap acrylics. So this is after a couple of hours that this was my Rory because when I've painted with acrylic paints over PVA before, it's then created these cracks. And you can see that's what's happened here with the Mod Podge. Um, so I was a little bit concerned as to whether that would happen if I had another coat, but I'm going to try it anyway. So I've got some copper paint there, although you could just use red and yellow acrylics. Um, that's the Vallejo um, kind of miniature paints. But again, just kind of home brand acrylics would work. And then I've got the purple metallic paint that I've used before as well on some of my other makes. I've got a pot of water. I've got some gold here. I do like to use the metallics. I just like the sheen, the finish that you get from them. But you really don't need to. It, it's completely up to you. And you could make the purple yourself, as I've just shown there with the red and the blue. You will need a plate to put your paints onto. And I'm using a smaller square brush as well. So yeah, you can see I've just switched on a light source here. That This is going to come in handy when I start to paint. I'm going to create a two-tone, create a two-tone um, two finish, should I, should I say. And again, this is based on the original source material, where you can see that kind of orange or purple effect. So where the shadows are, I want, the, want that to be purple. And where the highlights are, I want that to be more of the kind of the copper or the orange colour. So I'm using the light source to help me to get an idea of what I want to be light and what I want to be a bit darker. So I'm just preparing my mixing palette, just putting a small amount of each of the colour that I want to use. And then I'm just using a little bit of watered down purple paint in this instance. You don't have to use purple and orange. You could use whatever colour scheme you want to go for. But I'm just marking out where the shadows are in the position that I'm holding it now. Because obviously if I turned that piece, the shadows are going to move around. So I'm trying to keep it around about the same position. Just so the light source is then determining... Is that the right word? Determining where the, the shadows are, where the purple is in this case. So then I'm going to move to this kind of golden copper colour. It's not looking quite as orange as I wanted to, so I'm just adding a little bit of red and yellow in there just to make it a little bit brighter. So I'm just laying down kind of a base colour. So this is in the finished effect. You'll see it's quite a strong contrast at the moment. I don't want that amount of contrast. So I'm just going to soften that a little bit um, and just add some more variety to the, the colours that I'm using. So I'm using a bit of white with a little bit of red to make a very light pink. So this will form the highlights. Again, I'm taking all of these colour ideas from the reference material. So I've just painted in there roughly where I think the lighter areas would be, again, using the light source to help me. So the bits that are most reflective, I'm adding that kind of lighter tone. And then I've just added a bit of white to some of the purple. And I'm just going to use that then on the edges. So where the join is between the, the darker purple and the orange colour, I'm just going to soften that up with the lighter purple. And so we haven't got that harsh edge. Now you will have to kind of keep going backwards and forwards and touching this up. Um, it tends to help to go quite lightly as well. So don't press too heavy. 
keep moving back between the dark purple, the lighter purple, the light pink, the the orange and the golds. So while it's wet, I'm keeping the paint moving and that's what helps you to create a nice blend. If the paint dries, you've got to start that process again. So it's not that easy to to blend. It kind of comes with practice. But you will start to see it work. So again here, just on that edge, I'm just using the lighter purple. Just moving backwards and forwards. And if it's gone too light, I can then get a bit more of the darker purple and just kind of blend that back in. So just nice and gentle, just on the edge. You don't want to go too far into the orange because if you start to mix the purple and the orange, it will go kind of a brownish colour and you don't want that. We're just trying to soften the edge. Purple and yellow, they're complementary colours, so they are opposite each other on the colour wheel. So they're actually, they're not really suitable for blending. Um, complementary colours make each other stand out. So if you want a colour to pop, you put a complementary colour next to it. If you want a colour to blend, usually you would go with the colour next door to it on the colour wheel, and that's called a harmonious colour. I think in America it's analogous. I don't know if that's how it's pronounced. Um, so you tend to go with colours next door to one another to blend. So this is why I'm just softening the edge. I'm not trying to mix uh, the orange and the purple too much. Because it, it tends to not work very well. But you do get a nice contrast. And that's why I've stuck with this kind of colour scheme. Other complementaries would be red and green or blue and orange. And you can see there how it's much softer on the top now. So I think that kind of creates a nicer finish. So this is the bit that's the most time consuming in the whole process really. And it's just a case of doing this all over those joints. And you also might want to darken some sections as well. So again, just moving the object back to the light source. Thinking about where the darkest shadows would be. And then using a darker tone in those areas. So I'm doing the same again, just lightening that up. And because I've used pink on top of the, the orange, the pink and the purple, they are harmonious. So they do work together quite nicely. So you can get that blend. So just nice and softly with the brush. And it really is important that you use a good brush for this. So watercolour brushes are quite nice. Because they are much softer. Um, acrylic brushes aren't always that soft. They can be quite firm. Which is fine if you're using a canvas. But on here I want a softer edge. So I, I tend to stick to watercolour brushes because I think they're good all-rounder brushes, really. And so I feel much happier now with this edge. And they're the three pieces once um, they've had their colour added. I've used a little bit of gold in places as well just to kind of reflect the light. And there we go. So there's the three finished bases with their kind of complementary colour scheme. Kind of reminds me of the Beast Wars Megatron that came out. And here we go. So with the, the figures in place, so we've got the three zero there and the two masterpiece. And this is a Toy World um, Bumblebee. This is the World War II version. Which is, again is a fantastic little figure. And I think these four look really good together on those bases. I think the purple makes the yellow pop. Because again as I said earlier purple and yellow complement one another by making each other kind of pop out. And here it is just um, without the figures just to show you you can put any figures in place there. So thanks for watching and tune in again soon.